Leona von Bruchhorst, back in 1776, wrote a song based on <clears throat> Psalm 100. We have an opportunity to begin our worship with that. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart, and I will enter his courts with praise. <laughs> I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I do rejoice for him. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Harbor Joy's uh, Sunday service. 
Uh, not exactly what we had planned, but we are here. Uh, I need to have people start bringing back the baby bottles. They were due some time ago, but with the virus and the shutdown, we haven't been able to get together. Newsletter reports are due on May 22nd or thereabouts. There will be no band until next Sunday morning at 8.30 when we open up church service for everybody to join us. And those who are not ready yet, we will continue our prayers for everyone. Um, we're glad that the shingles on the roof are all done. And prayers, uh, we want to still pray for Lisa Floss's brother who is recuperating from his third surgery. Pastor Tim and Sharon, who are in North Dakota, and for our country. We want to thank Pastor Rick Porter for being here today in and amongst the raindrops and all of our fun this morning uh, to bring us the message. We thank you for the rain. And something we haven't done since we closed was uh, wish people happy birthdays. Maybe Bob wants to come up and uh, play a happy birthday song because I think... I'm really thinking he's got a birthday coming up Saturday and it's like 16 several times over. But happy birthday to everybody in the last few months. Charlie, so all of those that have birthdays in May, you can stand up. <laughs> and we'll say happy birthday. Before we have the scripture reading by, by Rick, we're going to sing one of the songs that he wrote. It's called Thrive. And actually, we'll, we'll be aware of when, when Rick shares the message today about the church. May we be ever mindful, as Mark Hall writes, know you and to make you known just to know you and make you known we lift your name on high shine like the sun make darkness run and hide we know we were made for so much more than ordinary lives it's time for us to more than just survive we were made to thrive
people of Harbor of Joy. Uh, it's uh, fun to be back with you, though, in this socially distanced way, not as fun as being with you in person. Uh, for the first time, I'm able to say I'm helping my neighbor, Pastor Tim Vogt, who uh, is my across-the-street neighbor up in Spirit Lake, and I'm able to uh, help Tim by being here with you in his absence, and I bless Tim and Sharon and hope they're having a great time where they are. Our New Testament reading is uh, from Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. It's entitled in the English Standard Version, from which I'll read, The Fellowship of Believers. Uh, you know, I'd like to give you a minute right there, wherever you are, to find this text, but at least tune in with your uh, listening as we look at Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came over every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who were believed were together and had everything in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. That word of the Lord 
right from after the day of Pentecost, which is now just a couple of weeks ahead of us, uh, when the church came together as the new embryonic church, just beginning, just full of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together as we begin today. Mighty God, we thank you for the church. And, and although we're interested in this novel situation in which we find ourselves, we look forward to the church regathering where uh, we can connect, share stories, uh, hear the amens of one another, encourage one another, and in person pray for one another. But I do now pray for the people of Harbor of Joy. I pray for the one who's feeling most lonely, for the one who may be experiencing physical affliction in a difficult time. And I pray also for this assembled body as plans are made and leaders are deciding as to how to best come together in these unusual times in which we live. I pray for Pastor Tim and for Sharon. I thank you for them and I ask a refreshment to them in their travels and safety in their return. And all of us pray for our nation and world. Uh, we, we here in the U.S. find this difficult because it's so different than what we've ever experienced. And yet my heart goes out to people around the world, many of whom are huddling, uh, hungry in uh, places where there is not any medical care and places where food supplies have dwindled and economic realities are crashing in in difficult ways. And in Jesus' name, we pray for the body of Christ around the globe, that you will fill us with your present light and that we will be radiant in the dark times in such a way that your love will go out no matter what comes upon the earth. We worship you, Lord, and now we pray as we've already sung uh, so well led by Bob. Word of God speak, pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty, to be still and know that you're in this place. Please let me stay and rest in your holiness. Word of God, speak. My wife Diane and I had an experience uh, uh, last Sunday, Mother's Day, where we finally reconvened with what we consider to be our church up in Mount Lake, Minnesota. And uh, it was fun because they had a drive-in service for Mother's Day. And so for the first time, I think, in my life, I went to a drive-in church service, attending in my car, tuning in via FM radio through the car radio, singing along, nodding and agreeing in prayer and uh, agreeing to the preaching of the word. And then we did one other thing that I've never done in church before. I honked my horn like crazy. After a song, at the end of the prayer, as the final blessing was concluded, we honked and honked and opened our sunroof and waved our hands to the pastor and to the leaders and Praise God together. We behaved like pent up people who wanted to let off a little Pentecostal steam. Christians gone wild. <laughs> Here's the takeaway. I was surprised how good it felt. Participation, celebration, relationship, albeit at a safe distance, but with visible experienced togetherness. The loneliness and the isolation was at least for one blessed Sunday beaten into submission by the unison cacophony of honking horns to God's glory. I was thinking, and I'm not sure this idea will fly at Harbor of Joy, but I was thinking, wouldn't it be fun as we come back together, whenever that is, if in our various buildings, on the pews, we mounted some of those old clown bicycle horns, so that rather than just quietly agreeing with the worship and the preaching, we could honk enthusiastically our joy before the Lord and one another. Just this week, I came across a question from someone who was on Facebook. They said, when did our churches go from celebration halls to lecture halls? And now we're quieter still. We've moved from lecture hall to living room. I look forward to making a joyful noise again together. These are fascinating, captivating, and dividing, sometimes fear-inducing times in which we live. I want to speak to those times generally, 
and for Harbor of Joy specifically. I'll do my best to speak without a personal agenda, even as we've sung and prayed, Word of God, speak. In our divided social context, there are lots of opinions and lots of opposing sides to be taken and assumptions made as to what side a person may be on based on a mask worn or not worn, a meme carelessly posted, or an opinion offered here or there. My purpose today is to remind you, the Church of Jesus Christ, the redeemed of the Lord, the heaven-bound, the salt and light of the earth, to remind you who you are in these times when our rhythms are lost and our comforts are shaken. The governors have used a word, and uh, I don't uh, envy any governor in this day and age, having to make decisions and taking the input of so many in such divided times. The governors have thrown around a word uh, for the church, along with other entities, non-essential. Now, you can understand that as a 16-year-old boy, I felt the call of God on my life to serve Christ through the church, the call to pastoral leadership. Uh, so having now later in life given all of my years to that, you can understand that I'm a little bit unsettled by calling that to which I committed my entire life non-essential. In fact, I understand the gospel of Jesus Christ to be the most essential thing in all time and eternity. And I, in the current chaos, believe it now more than ever. So it won't surprise you that I would prefer if the governors found a more precise way to describe the church. And to be fair, some are doing so. The church is essential, but usually characterized by socially intimate crowds of hundreds or even thousands, hugging and singing and eating and coughing, and therefore we're a viral risk. We need to be prudent. The church is essential, but often populated with many who are most at risk because of advancing years. We need to care for these. The church is essential, but perhaps able to carry out her mission in other less communal ways, thereby showing God's love to all. Make no mistake, the local gatherings of Christ's followers called the church, and someone has estimated that on any given Sunday there are 37 million churches meeting around the world. These gatherings are not optional entertainment or like a ball game or theater, something we show up to when we feel like it. The church is a necessary outpost of the good news of Jesus, offering love, forgiveness, acceptance, and inclusion to all, and the encouragement even to the faithful who are regular parts of those church. In prudently reopening to offer these things, we help address a major problem of our current situation. And here's what that problem is. It was driven home to me listening to a radio program a few nights ago from KICD, the John Batchelor program, on the evenings on KICD from Spencer. And I liked that program. I was listening in, and Bachelor was interviewing an attorney by the name of Ken Feinberg. Feinberg is fairly well known. He's an author and a, and a thinker and a commentator. And Bachelor asked him, how is this crisis different than other national crises through which we have survived? Think Pearl Harbor, think uh, the Depression, think 9-11. And Ken Feinberg didn't even hesitate a moment. He answered with one word. He said, this is different because we're isolated. In the other crises, we were able to come together to face them, to process them, and to agree how we would proceed to address them. He said, in this crisis, we've been told to go to our homes and keep our distance. Believe it or not, even in a period of well-documented and even celebrated decline of religion, the Church of Jesus Christ is one of the greatest de-isolators of contemporary society. In any given week, according to recent research, one-third of the population of the United States participates in a church or a synagogue. That's over 100 million people. By comparison, only about 1% of that shows up for an NFL game on any given weekend. Stadium contests may get the headlines, but the church is the steady, quiet, connecting, caring influence that soldiers on for much more than a 16-week season each year. 
Some have referred to the church as a vital third place, added to home and work and school. Uh, other clubs and organizations may fill that as well, but the church is the most uh, uh, widespread, participated in, and essential third place in our culture. If that's true, what is our default? When uh, out of love for our communities and submission to those in authority over us, we've been able, we've been unable to ascend, assemble. A first solution has been to transmit the production uh, using upfront people like Bob Floss and Charlie Hurdle and myself, musicians, liturgists, pastors. There's nothing wrong with that. If you happen to be watching now, we're doing it now. And it's one way the church can continue to serve in these times. However, we dare not stop there, and we certainly dare not settle for that kind of distance. John Wesley said, there's no thing, there's nothing, there is no such thing as a solitary Christian. So if the problem is isolation, an online church is the only stopgap and partial temporary solution, what shall we do? How shall we redeem this sad and difficult season to find ourselves better because of it? Here's my answer, and it's a biblical answer, and we're going to get to our text. Get back to basics. Get back to basics. At a distance now, and whenever we come together, get back to basics. Let's read our text again, this time in that uh, much more literary version called The Message. Um, Acts 42, Acts 2.42. They committed themselves... They were devoted, the other version said, to the teaching of the apostles, to the life together, to the common meal, and to the prayers. It goes on to say they pooled their resources, they followed a daily discipline of worship, and they praised God. Let's quickly pull out five uh, lessons from that one text. Basics, back to basics. What should we do now? Let's go back to these basics that were there at the very beginning of the church. Basic number one, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching in such a way that the instruction was reproducible in others. In, in this context, in fact, today, in a few moments, we're going to recite the creed together, passing that apostolic instruction on down through the generations. Sunday school classes, Bible study groups, confirmation classes, all of this is the stuff of devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching. And this is a basic we dare not lose in this time of interruption. It's a critical departure from the celebrity pastor model, which frankly, the internet church or the television church uh, seems to promote. In reality, we really don't want person, one person doing all the talking like I'm doing right now. What we really want is for the maturity in Christ to be spread out across the body so that older ones teach younger ones generation to generation. A.W. Tozer said, if your Christianity depends on upon, upon a pastor's preaching, then you're a long way from being where you should be. What if the internet was down? We've had a few struggles this morning here recording this. What if the internet was down and audio video transmission was impossible and we could not gather for whatever reason? What would we do? How would we be the necessary church? We must be developing mature men and women who know God's word, who love others, and who can adequately convene pastor and teach others to continue and multiply the faith without regard for social context. And let me tell you, around the world, in many nations where oppression is the reality, this is the way the church functions today. And so rather than simply saying, we can't wait to get through this time, we perhaps should be saying, what can we learn from this time that will make us stronger for all times? Let's not miss a key word there in that phrase where they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves. Strong word, committed in some versions. I think uh, another thing that's going to come out of this time is that some maybe will learn that the church doesn't mean all that much to them. 
that they were nice church attenders, but maybe they're learning in distancing that they're not devoted, passionate followers of Jesus Christ. I hope not, but I think it could happen. I also predict there'll be another response from those who have longed to get together with brothers and sisters in Christ. They'll be back, perhaps with renewed enthusiasm. Perhaps they'll become obnoxious, happy-faced, horn-honking, hallelujah-shouting people, not unlike I experienced just a week ago. It's essential that we be devoted to the Bible and to teaching and learning and developing leaders for generations to come. That's basic number one. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Basic number two, they valued people over possessions. They held all things in common. Church was such a place of love in sacrificial community. And, and I think crisis times can invite this perhaps more than comfortable times. Such a place of sacrificial community that they were able to care for one another in ways that were costly to those who were offering the care. One of the things I've said to pastors when they've said, how do I pastor in this time? I've said, and this isn't easy for me. I'm not good at it. I'm kind of an introvert and rather have enjoyed these times. Confession. But I've said to pastors, get on the phone. Call your people. Let them know. Pray with them. See how they're doing. Valuing people over possessions. Holding things in common. I heard of a church, knew the church, attended the church for some a season of my life, where one day in a communion service, uh, a woman got up and shared, and they had a sharing time during their communion, that she could not pay her electric bill. And she asked the church to pray with her, and really was by implication asking if anyone could help her. A man stood up right after her, and he said, you know, I received an unexpected check this week, and I brought it with me, believing I was to share it this week. He said, and I didn't know what it was for, but I know now it's for your electric bill. I'll make sure you get this money. When they touched base later, they were both surprised to find that the amount of the check in his pocket was exactly the amount of her electric bill. You know what? That might work on Zoom or it might not. But I know that it works when the body comes together and the spirit in us post-Pentecost works to bring us together in mysterious ways where we hold all things in common. Basic number three, the common meal. I'm taking this to mean everything from fellowship gatherings, which here at Harbor <laughs> includes those nice treats and coffee that we get before the service. Today it was just coffee. It had a Snickers creamer, so it was pretty good. Charlie made it, I think. Uh, so I'll take it. It was a fellowship meal of sorts. It includes that to love feasts, to potlucks, to church dinners, and all the way, I believe, to the Lord's table, to the Eucharist. Scholars argue about what Luke intended here when he said the common meal, breaking bread together. But I'm content that by placing breaking bread between fellowship and prayers, Luke is speaking of some kind of transitional model between the Jewish feasts flowing to the sacred supper that Christ instituted. I don't know about you, but what I miss most about the church is Holy Communion. When the body of Christ receives the body of Christ, when we eat the bread and drink the cup, we can turn on the TV or computer and grab our grape juice and our bread or our cracker, but we cannot do it truly together in televised isolation. And I think that's one of the great losses of this period because this is essential to the church. Basic number four, prayers. He said they joined in offering prayers. Now, if there's anything that we can do, can be done in isolation, it's prayer. Jesus said it was better to go to your closet than to pray on the street corner. But again, isolation loses the power of agreement. It also loses the power of shared tears when someone pours out their heart and asks for prayer. And more than that, it loses the power of the touch, the laid on hands appropriately to connect deeply from the body to the inner self, the spirit. Now, if my pastoral experience is any indicator, it's fairly easy 
to keep prayer groups to less than 10 people. They seem to find that level themselves, but that's another problem and another sermon. I can't say when Harbor of Joy will gather. I think it's being worked out right now and maybe it's being announced clearly. It maybe was and I wasn't listening. Um, but here's what I know. I don't think there's anything that would stop two or three people from gathering in a home this week to pray for your church, your community, and our world. They prayed. That was one of their basics. Basic number five, they worshiped and praised God together. The text in verse 46 says they followed a daily discipline of worship in the temple, followed by meals at home. Uh, every meal, a celebration, exuberant and joyful as they praised God. This brings me back to horn honking. It was a form of individual praise in corporate context, safely distanced, at least in our day. Being together before the Lord was necessary and essential for it expressed the relationship for which we were created and then recreated in Christ after relationship was broken by sin. I experience this alone sometimes when I'm driving uh, across the beautiful fields of Iowa and Minnesota. I will break into song and I'm, my, my warbly voice isn't offensive to anyone when I'm alone. And I will praise God. I experience it in my living room as Diane and I tune in to this church or that church and worship with them. But we also experience it when we join our church family in redeemed community to praise our God and Redeemer. Pastor Greg Jorgensen, who pastors just down the road at Downtown Church, posted these reflections on Facebook just this week as Downtown Church reopened again with care being taken for health's sake uh, just last Sunday. And I'm quoting Greg now. He said, it just hit me a few days ago that I hadn't sung in seven weeks. What I mean to say is I period, had period, not period, sung period, in period, seven period, weeks, exclamation point. Many reasons for that, obviously, including karaoke being shut down. And then he put a sad face. But one of the things I missed most, he continues, over those seven weeks, was hearing the people of God sing of grace together, both to him and also to each other. Those have been some of my most sacred, emotional, and healing times in life. So let's say it, the church gathered is not a luxury or an option. We are the necessary church, essential for holistic life and health. Holistic, not just in our physical exterior, but to the very core of our being, where we are known and know by God and others and have within us this witness of the given Holy Spirit. These basics are necessary antidotes to isolation and to isolation's nasty posse, fear, and depression. We need these basics. And we need them now in distancing. We need them in the next several weeks as we come back together. And you know what happened? It's the very conclusion of the, paragraph, of the passage. When the church lived these basics in the power of the Holy Spirit, here's what the last verse says. People in general liked what they saw. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There's lots of ways to apply this. As you apply it to your church, one writer has said, reset your why. Why do you do what you do? This is a great time to rethink it as you come back together. Why do we do what to do? And then to review and renew your mission. Are there things that need to be sorted out that aren't important anymore? And are there other things that are more important? And I would say to you, the basics of Acts chapter, Acts chapter 2 certainly would be on that list of necessities, of importance of essentials for the necessary church. And then let me give one personal application and we'll be done. That's this. Are you looking forward to reconvening? Do you look forward to the Lord's table? Do you look forward to agreeing prayer? Do you look forward to praise and worship? Do you look forward to the teaching and recitation of the word and the creeds? I know I do. I can't wait. I might bring my horn, but do you? Because if you don't, 
there's still enough alone time to seek your own heart and pray in isolation, Lord, renew my eagerness to join my body in person again. And if you do, well, be patient, encourage your leaders, pray for them, and come together just as soon as the church can come together. Will you join me in reciting uh, some of the apostles' teaching? Obviously, it arose a century or two, maybe even three, after the apostolic season, but it is a wonderful condensation of that which is handed down across the years to the church, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, as is our custom, let's do the basics. Pray together, and we'll do so by praying as the Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Great basic words devoted to the apostles' teaching, valuing people, a common meal, prayers, and worshiping grace God together. So we close with an old gospel song called Standing on the Promises. I'm standing on those promises. Standing on the promises of Christ thy King. text, and I had chosen a benediction, but in the battle of the closing good words, your text wins. So I want to speak this blessing over Harbor of Joy from uh, the book of Hebrews, very familiar text, but so appropriate for our times. He who promised is faithful, standing mm -hmm. on the promises. He who promised is faithful. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. 
Let us not give up meeting together, but let us encourage one another. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God bless you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.